If you tilt the globe and zoom in on the Arctic, you can see a new future on the horizon. By 2040, the ice on the North Pole will have melted. We know about the dangers, but what opportunities are there? And who is going to seize them? After all, a world without Arctic ice means a whole new area will emerge, one to explore, to mine and to navigate. In the North, people are already excited. The Chinese are sniffing around Iceland. Norwegians are signing treaties with the Russians to profit from a new transportation route right across the Arctic. And Greenland is the only country in the world to be rising faster than the sea level. For the first time, its future is looking bright. New land for sale. Agriculture, mining, oil, gas. If you have the money, you can buy it. Time to focus on the players who see global warming as a golden opportunity. This is what you are about to see. Iceland and Greenland uh, are in the last five years experiencing more interest from Asia, leading countries in Asia, in the Arctic, than from leading countries on the European continent. We simply refuse to be the losers of climate change. We have lived 4,500 years in Greenland. We have undergone several climate changes. We have managed them all. We are going to manage this one too, with new opportunities, with new challenges. This is VPRO Backlight. Welcome to the promised climate change. For the North, global warming is a blessing. Its inhabitants will be the ones who will benefit from it. The ice is visibly disappearing and more land is emerging. The sea temperatures are rising and new species of fish are arriving. This region, which was once before inhabitable, is slowly awakening from a long hibernation. There is space, there is water, there is food, there are minerals, and there are energy sources, all kinds of sources, fossil fuels as well as renewable sources. All still untouched by modern civilization, but not for long, because the North is on the rise and making itself heard. It will have an importance to many other countries around the world to fight climate change, but at the same time also to mitigation adaptation. Greenland country is rising, and uh, whereas other countries are sinking. Greenland's ice cap and its role climatically, globally, is enormous. For the past 300 years, Greenland has been a Danish colony. Now that the country no longer consists solely of huge stretches of thick ice and holds unknown quantities of oil, gas and minerals, the Greenlanders are seeing the possibility of becoming independent. Greenlandic people are rising. They are rising people. They are people that are rising as an indigenous peoples in a global sense. What Greenland in mining section, it will have a global impact. Is there a form of gold fever going on in the north? Who knows what natural treasures have been hiding in the soil for centuries? The ice is there, it's been there for at least half a million years or something like that, maybe more. But uh, some areas are opening up and what it leaves behind is bare rock. There's no trees, there's no uh, soil or anything on the surface, it's wide open. So you can see the geology as this ice retreats back to the center of Greenland. It leaves exposed rock just like this. This might have been covered with ice 10 or 12,000 years ago. With all the available land and natural resources, parties all over the world are showing an interest in the Arctic. Every self-respecting oil or gas company is trying to get a firm foothold. International researchers are paying visits and enterprising northerners are starting companies to show all these newcomers around. Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear words saying. Haralder Birgesen works for an organization called Arctic Services and offers support to the oil, gas and mining industries. 
Haldor Johansson represents important Chinese businessmen with his company Arctic Portal. Sergei Balmasov is Russian and runs the Center for High North Logistics, a kind of tourist information point for the shipping industry in the far north. At a conference, Rasmus Bertelsen, researcher of international relations, talks about the opportunities he sees for green energy and data servers. Even journalists at small local news stations are busy with the sudden influx. They are doing seismological work to, to map the seafloor in the Kara Sea, where they uh, expect to find huge amounts of oil and gas. And President Grimson of Iceland is in seventh heaven with all the recent international attention. This 50-strong Chinese delegation consists of people from various different disciplines. They are all seeking to collaborate with northerners such as the Icelanders. The um, area that we'll, we're driving through is uh, called Svalbardstrand, as in uh, most places. There's been a lot of change in uh, urbanization in Iceland. China's state television follows the delegation every step of the way as they investigate the possibilities for building golf courses, theme parks, for grasping logistical opportunities or doing scientific research. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, groundbreaking ceremony of the Aurora Observatory here in Kaurhot, Reykjadalur, north of Iceland. Uh, but you're actually standing in the, or in the slope of the hill where the building will be built. Mr. Hallgrimur, who stands here, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Hu uh, Chin Yang, yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit confused in these Chinese names. The Chinese are showing interest in every possible way. <laughs> the foundations of the first Chinese Icelandic research centre are being laid here. <laughs> While the Chinese have already arrived on the shores of Iceland, Greenland too is seeking the attention of foreign investors. Preparations are being made to lure potential future financiers. In the old days, people could only get food from the sea and nothing grew on the land. Now the first steps towards growing fruit and vegetables are being made. Last summer, when she was still Prime Minister, Aleka Hammond travelled around the south of her country to observe the changes with her own eyes. This year is the first time ever that uh, strawberries will be on the market for sale. First time ever. Uh. See the strawberries. See how big they are. Mmm. I bet this is the best strawberry of the world. <laughs> A summer with 24 hours of daylight has many advantages. The growing season for, for hay, as this one here, 
has really, really changed within the last uh, few years. Normally they would only harvest once during summer. But these years they're harvesting twice during summer because it's growing so much faster than before. I think it's very simple. I think it's very simple because the simple thing is that the Greenlanders want to become independent. And uh, that's a simple thing. But the hard thing is that uh, the economic background for us to achieve economic independency from Denmark and to be free of the block grants from Denmark requires us to think different than we did before. It requires us to, to let the big economic wheels of the country run. The Prime Minister continues her trip by helicopter, as there are no roads connecting the villages yet. When she arrives in Kakortok, the fishermen are pleased to tell her about the warmer waters. It's huge. It's huge, yes. And it's from, we were in East Greenland, because there was ice here, out here. So, but this is an exceptionally good. And the cod is in a very good shape in, in, in Greenland, because we know it, it's very healthy. So the cod stock is coming up. The cod is bigger than ever. And for the first time, new species of fish are appearing, such as mackerel and herring. Today's Greenland is pulling out all the stops. They are advertising everything they have to offer. Once they grow their own wheat and crops, and with all the new fish in the sea, they will no longer be dependent on seal hunting. However, the country does still produce its traditional luxury items and souvenirs. I think that all sailors are the best the smugest som jeg ikke synes er personligt, men uh, som uh, bukset til nationaldragten er spillet den smukkeste af dem alle sammen. I Nordgrunden er bruges uh, ringsælen til, uh, til bukser, hvor man spillet sælen er mere i, i Grønland. Se, den er flot. Hold op, hvor den flot. But above all else, Greenland has its mining industry, with its land full of precious minerals such as gold, diamonds and uranium. It can acquire big investors and show Denmark the door once and for all. They're looking to change and get into this new mining boom that Greenland is expecting at any moment been talking about it for years, but it's, it's happening. The Greenland government has been promoting itself a lot at conferences, these worldwide mining uh, conferences, Australia, Canada, China. They've been advertising this country is open for business. And they've set up a system where it's easy to get a permit for exploration. And it's kind of a streamlined application process from exploration into development of an actual mine if they're so lucky. So it's partly the economy and partly the government trying to sell the country to the world that we're open for business here in Greenland now. The focus in Greenland minerals, the focus in Greenland's new autonomy has put Greenland under another sort of a pressure than ever did before. Ice disappearing, the fjords getting ice free is also affecting us in our traditions, in our economies, and in our political um, priorities. And uh, as an indigenous population trying to manage life in a global sense, requires us to adapt very fast. If we are not to be the losers of climate change, we simply refuse to be the losers of climate change. We have lived 4,500 years in Greenland. We have undergone several climate changes. We have managed them all. We are going to manage this one too with new opportunities, with new challenges. Back to Iceland, where the Chinese have arrived. Like Greenland, this island was once a Danish colony, but they have been independent for more than half a century. 
we are experiencing a strong interest from the smaller communities all over the Arctic region to cooperate with Iceland, to learn from our experience, to have a dialogue with us, how we have moved from being a Danish colony, gaining independence, struggling as a small nation to deal with all of, all of the challenges of the, of the 20th century. The Icelandic president proudly explains to the Chinese television crew what his country has to offer. There is now a possibility to utilize the wind, the hydro, the geothermal across the Arctic regions and through electric grids and cables link that into some very prominent markets, whether they are in Europe. With its green energy, Iceland is now particularly attractive with its hydrothermal energy and hydropower already providing 100% of the country's energy supply. Rasmus Bertelsen is a consultant for international energy and IT companies. He stresses the opportunities for green energy in the future at the Icelandic conference. What about if we could connect renewable energy sources in the Arctic with electricity markets in the south? I mean, there's talk about laying a subsea power line from Iceland to Scotland and further down to Europe. What if Icelandic hydropower could replace British nuclear power? Running the internet takes a lot of power. Running data, uh, data parks, uh, server parks, data farms takes a lot of power. The people of Iceland want to make the most of their green energy, not just for their own energy supply system. The large stretches of empty land could become profitable regions if they were to host large data storage servers which require lots of energy. These servers could also be used by companies such as Amazon or Facebook, but also by organizations and governments to keep their online data running. We already start seeing that, for example, in Lulo in northern Sweden, the uh, European, uh, the European uh, data center of Facebook is placed in Lulo, and that's, Lulo has a very good technical university, so it, it contributes to, how to say, a local, globally connected knowledge economy. The servers hold a lot of information, which companies and governments want to keep protected. There is, in the 21st century, clearly a need to have a location where we can store the data in a safer way and in a more democratic way. Where can we have a kind of safe havens for our data? Where can a journalist or an individual or an organization or a company or a university or a researcher store their data in the belief that it will be secure and not accessed by anybody else? Iceland is becoming a safe data haven, an exporter of green energy, and the Chinese are investing in the country. In Greenland, seal hunters can become farmers, fishers or miners. The North is fundamentally changing as a result of the rising temperatures, but the most spectacular change lies right above Russia and Norway. A new shipping route is opening up. The entire North Pole is shrinking before our eyes, and the ice is making way for the open sea. Some brave entrepreneurs see business in the newly emerging routes. Until now, the well-known shipping routes between Asia and Europe have run via the Straits of Malacca and the Suez Canal. A northern sea route is now becoming an alternative. It may even render the old route obsolete. Small towns like Kirkenes are realizing how they can play a big role in this. Their northerly position will now work to their advantage. The harbour in Kirkenes is the first European port for vessels from Asia travelling the Northern Sea Route. Sergei Balmasov at the Centre for High North Logistics helps shipping companies with such matters as applying for permits, predicting where vessels may still encounter ice, and booking Russian icebreakers to guide the vessels through the Northern Sea Route. Слушай, мне касательно вот этого сезона, когда вообще вот первое судно, которое на транзит прошло, примерно стартовало? 
То есть я считаю, что в принципе до 15 ноября все нормально будет продолжаться, и дальше надо будет уже смотреть там Панамакс, то те же 18 будут обслуживать и свои маски и писать. Ну, может быть, там 25. The distance can be 50% or 30-50% less using the Northern Sea Route, depending on the geographical locations. And this is the main reason why people were interested to use that route, to reduce the costs for the fuel and to reduce the time of the vessel usage. Sergei helps people like Felix Chudi by providing the latest information on conditions along the route. This Norwegian entrepreneur runs a family business, Chudi Shipping, and in 2010 he was the first to have a non-Russian ship sail to China via the Northern Sea Route. As a shipping company we had some respect for ourselves. Uh, we. So we, at least we have to investigate the possibility of using the Northern Sea Route for carrying that uh, iron ore concentrate to China. We are spending quite a lot of effort uh, on promoting the use of the Northern Sea Route and uh, raising the awareness of uh, what, is, what the opportunities are, what is possible. And, uh, and in that sense, we are probably the company outside Russia which is the most focused on the Northern Sea Route. The route is still very young. It was only four years ago when the first commercial vessels sailed this route, which is only ice-free in the summer months. Since then, the number of ships on this route has doubled every year. Investors see a golden future. The possibilities are endless. But where exactly is the gold? The commercial possibilities for the Northern Sea Route are quite wide, but, you know, uh, since the route uh, was used by Russians only before the, the international community is, is still learning how to use that. And the main driving forces here are, first of all, the cargo bays. Kirkenes is a very good located port and deep water port, but in order to, uh, you know, the save, in order to serve the big traffic, the harbor should be, you know, improved and developed further. And there is a plan of development of, of the harbor, but it it requires a lot of money. Felix Chudi bought a piece of land that is being converted into a harbour. His dream is to build a big port for the ships sailing the northern sea route. We think that this area could be used for, uh, as a platform for industrial activity. We got all the plans approved. It's a big investment, but of course the need is quite big as well in this, uh, in this area. Chudi might be dubbed the saviour of Kirkenes. He bought an iron ore mine, which had been closed down 10 years previously. Most of the town had worked there. When Chudi arrived in Kirkenes, the mine was still for sale, but half of the town's population had left. Chudi Shipping had a chance to buy that company in 2006, and we bought it because of the uh, infrastructure which the company owned, the port infrastructure, which we think will play a big role and an important role with regard to transportation in the Arctic. Of course, that reopening of the mine was a huge catalyst for activity in Kirkenes because suddenly there was a need for uh, subcontractors su supporting the mine reopening, uh, em employees. There was not enough uh, workforce available here, so people would start to commute to Kirkenes and uh, People started also to settle in Kirkenes, and you know, there's been an uh, industrial reawakening, I would say, of Kirkenes uh, since that time, since 2007. The Norwegian town's luck had changed. When the mine reopened, its position turned out to be ideal for the Northern Sea Route. Norway's and Russia's gold lies at the bottom of the sea along the northern coasts. For years, there was a dispute over what belonged to whom at sea. Russia even planted a flag underwater to mark their territory. There was a 40 years discussions between Russia and Norway uh, regarding this delimitation line uh, in the Barents Sea. And in 2012, it was a successfully resolved. And here you can see the new map and now the territories are clearly identified what belongs to Russia and what belongs to Norway. Now that the underwater border has finally been established, the digging for oil and gas can begin. The black gold is there for the taking. 
energy, it's a basis for the economy. All the factory, plants, cars, everything is now, you know, is based on the oil and gas resources. All the Europe need gas to heat the, you know, uh, to, to houses. We need uh, gas for production. We, we all need the resources. Uh, you see me the car sea, all these yellow spots are uh, already identified structure. All this costs money. If we imagine that there will be no oil and gas here in the Karasi, in the Arctic, or in the western part of the uh, Barents Sea, then I would say that we may forget about the uh, development of the infrastructure. Trude Pettersen is a journalist at the Barents Observer, a local newspaper. The online newspaper is suddenly finding itself at the heart of international news. Since the Northern Sea Route has been opened, all big oil and gas companies have jumped on the bandwagon. The gas goes either through pipelines here and onto the Russian uh, gas pipeline system mm. and into Europe and wherever they export their gas. They are also planning to build an a LNG plant here, liquid natrified, liquefied natural gas, um, to export it with vessels. Uh, along the Northern Sea Route to Asia or even to Europe. So they're both building the pipeline and the LNG plant. It would create 150 new jobs here in Kirkenes because you need a lot of um, oil spill preparedness equipment, boats, tugs, etc. We see that many companies are exper still experimenting on the route. They are sending their vessels there in, in, in ballast, you know, without any cargo, just with... It seems like they're kind of checking out the route. How many, how many days does it take? Uh, it, how is the ice situation over there? How does it work with the Russian nuclear um, icebreakers and that? Um, how is everything up there? And finally, the North can also count on the inevitable human urge to discover. Climate tourists are on the rise. In Greenland, the first tour guides are ready, with fully equipped buses to take anyone who is willing and able to buy a ticket to the edge of the melting ice cap. So the store here, egg and eels, the fisk. Yeah, there are billions, billions of mosquitoes here. They can survive in the frost for many, many years, but it's good for us because all the small birds feed on them. The peregrine feed on the small birds. Also without them, we wouldn't have all the birds here. Altogether, we have about 100 kilometers of road here. There are no roads connecting any towns here. If you want to go to one town to another, you have to, uh, at least from here, you have to take an airplane. Go for safety, there are loose sten, loose grus. Ude på isen, there are pigge, ispigge. So you should also go for safety, for if you fall, you scare you your head when you take it from. So still and roly. We have circa a team. We see it today here, seniors tell them. This is the longest road in Greenland, 30 kilometers long. It doesn't connect any villages, but ends here at the ice cap. The road was once built by Volkswagen to test their cars. In year 2001, the Volkswagen finished to make the road. At that time, the ice was the same height as the Moraine. Last summer, we measured it, it melted 23 meters down. 
it's almost two meter per year. It's about, I'm not sure, maybe 100 meters uh, back. So it's getting warmer here. Når jeg kommer over den første bro op ad skrænden, der er meget glat, der skal lige tage på. Der er jo is lige under det her. The ice is melting fast, and we can all come and see it. Climate tourism is becoming a well-known term. Der er også is lige ned under her. Se den sten her. Der står jo skygger for solen. Så det kommer over at stå på ligesom forhøjning. Sidste sæson, sidste sommer, tre gange så væltede den ned. Så kommer der en ny høj. Og det ændrer sig fra dag til dag, så vi så flytte broerne. The guide tells us he has had some famous visitors in the past. He was a tour guide for UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon. The socially engaged singer Bono and even Dutch King Willem Alexander visited this exact spot. Only a handful of families live on these empty plains of Iceland. They are having to get used to all the international attention. My night has been here since 1880. My parents have been here. Og afi og amma og allt í einu þá koma kynverjar og langa til að kaupa. Þeir vilja kaupa? Hafa nóg að peninga. Út um allan heim, jarðir og vega nóg að peninga. Ég er ekki hrifin að því. Við eigum að hafa landið eins ósnortið og við getum. Skila því áfram til barnan okkar og afkomanda okkar. Ekki við þess að græðki að selja allt sem við eigum. Selja allt núna. Ég held að ég erði ekkert hamingi samari þó ég fengi fullt af peningum. Ég... Sko... Þú finnur hamingjuna ekkert í peningu. Þó þessi trygging að eiga eitthvað af peningum en peningar þú færð, þú kaupir ekki hamingju fyrir peninga. En ég hugsa að það verið ekki gott fyrir Ísland að kæmu hér businessmenn og keiftu margar jarðir kannski. Það er ekki góð þróun fyrir Ísland. Þó að það yrði kannski góð laust fyrir okkur að selja þegar við erum gömul en við megum ekki líta þannig á að það sé það er ekki gott fyrir afkamdur okkar fyrir börn og barnabörn og það er ekki gott að ef að við færum að selja hluta af Íslandi til kynverja ég er ekki Ég held að það sé ekki gott. Haldur Johansson offered Sigur and Bragi 5 million dollars for their land on behalf of Chinese businessman Huang Nubo. So it's a, it's a, it's a good offer, but I think it's um, realistic compared to the uh, size of the land and, and the location. So um, we have seen it as a, as a very fair and, and good deal for everyone. In the end, the Icelandic couple decided to sell. To the owners, they're elderly people. They saw this as a way to have a pension. They've been farmers all their life. They saw this opportunity to sell this, this land who nobody has had interest in for, for ever before. There's this uh, person, he happens to be from China, who saw the opportunity because he's a traveler himself. He likes the wilderness, likes to be able to be outside without being disturbed. To reinforce ties with the interested Chinese parties, Haldor has co-organized the Northeast Conference. Everyone from researchers to businessmen is invited. 
The president of Iceland welcomes the Chinese with open arms. As the Americans don't need the island for their army base anymore, and the EU abandoned the country at the depth of the recession, he has used Iceland's independence and strategic position to barter a newly signed free trade treaty with China. It proves, in my opinion, that the old-fashioned view of the Arctic, that it is a faraway place of little consequences for people in the rest of the world, is now completely outdated. China, in turn, has opened an enormous embassy on Iceland, a country with a population of only 325,000. The embassy could house workspace for up to 500 people. What we have seen in terms of embassies in Iceland, we saw India opening up a new embassy in Iceland uh, six years ago. Uh, Japan has now declared they're going to open a proper embassy uh, in Iceland. We are seeing a stronger representation from Singapore and South Korea. So it's not just China. It is a, a gathering of Asian nations that are now having a stronger dialogue and stronger representation with all of us. Whereas Iceland is completely independent, Greenland isn't quite there yet. The country has been autonomous since 2009 and has used its autonomy to lift the ban on uranium mining. I lifted the ban and uh, that created uh, headlines around the world. That created headlines around the world within the mining section but also within many other sections around the world. The geopolitical issue regarding Greenland was set on agenda. Lifting the ban opened the way for companies all over the world to come and explore the soil in search of potential gold, iron, rubies and rare earth metals. The good thing about Greenland economy using the new potential of uh, mining is that we would like to set our mining based on renewable resource. We are 70 percentage self-sustaining regarding renewable resource based on our hydropower. Creating new mining section with the energy of hydropower is a fantastic combination that is not, is hardly seen any place around the world. And try again from there, try drilling now. The area was already known from the 50s where they were exploring for, or not exploring, but they were developing uranium from there. And Denmark said, we don't want any more uranium, no more uranium for us. And then the area went quiet. And as our technologies change, we have phones and all kinds of crazy stuff that need these rare earth metals. It's become interesting again. And they found that not only is there uranium, but attached to this uranium, there's a whole bunch of other metals that we can use today. We need this stuff. We need iron for everything. We need, you know, the whole cities are iron and, and concrete. You, know? you can't build a city without iron. You can't build a bridge. You can't build a car. You can't build hardly anything, a ship, without iron. Iron's very, very important, especially in places like China and India that are developing so quickly. They need a lot of this stuff. Rare earth is very important. It's a very highly demanded um, element for creating in the technological society. And uh, not only is it of interest here, it is of huge economic interest. It would create jobs for Greenlanders for many, many years ahead, also for the next generations. Not only cr will it create jobs, there will be jobs, jobs enough for the next generation as well. So what we're doing here is what they call diamond core drilling. And it's uh, used in exploration for mining or engineering for mining or building anything underground. These are the uh, core samples. It's a practice, yeah. This is a six week course in diamond core drilling where they can get a job as a helper on a drill rig in Greenland. And uh, eventually, hopefully, they can become drillers on their own. There, there is so many interest uh, from outside uh, in, in the world.
Before I came here, I worked in a fishing factory. I was a uh, sinking core teacher in the 12 years. Handyman in a hotel in uh, Manito. That was for uh, two years ago. I didn't have any work after that. I want to improve my future so I can uh, be prepared to take any jobs. If opportunity is good, I can move to another place. Yeah. Now we are going home, sweet home. Get down there to walk through the fog. We'll uh, make a brief stop, and then I will not, uh, like I said, burden you with uh, more stories. Thank you. I mention this here today because often, when I meet people from other parts of the world to talk about the Arctic, the test case of their involvement in the Arctic cooperation should not be economic interest or political significance, but the clear, constructive, and real scientific cooperation. The present generation of leadership in Europe has been brought up on a world view where the Arctic is not really important. And that is why, paradoxically, Iceland and Greenland uh, are in the last five years experiencing more interest from Asia, leading countries in Asia, in the Arctic, than from leading countries on the European continent. So the state of play with respect to the Arctic now is how the leading European countries will catch up with the leading Asian countries with respect to their presence uh, in the Arctic. You should look up when the uh, president of South Korea went to Greenland and then ask yourself the question, uh, has any president or prime minister of leading European country been to Greenland in recent years for a similar purpose? In a way, I like the Chinese system because they have a long-term vision. This is something we are lacking. We're lacking the long-term vision. And it probably has to do with the fact that we change governments every four years. To understand the future of global warming, we should follow the financial developments in the North. These will tell us what we can expect in the North and make us think about how we want to utilize this new region. People generally go where money is being made. The North offers new opportunities and these will be seized no matter what. The Chinese, in any case, have understood this. You just never know how important the North may become in the future. They should be interested, just as the EU and just as the US and others. Again, because of the resources in the Arctic, because of possible transportation routes, because of climate change. I mean, as they pointed out themselves, if climate change continues and uh, the water levels will rise, then, of course, it's going to impact China more than probably any country. Like Holland and, and China will be probably most affected by it. And <clears throat> that's, uh, that's an interesting perspective at, at the same time, because they would have to relocate hundreds of millions of people. And that's not, an, and that's not a small task. Considering the fact that the rising sea level could make the Netherlands disappear, 
Investing in a piece of land in a picturesque village somewhere in the far north might not be such a bad idea. The north, traditionally in the Western vision, was a far away, isolated territory of very little, if no consequence. And the action was somewhere else uh, in the world. That somehow in the 21st century, the north will become the center of the action and of greater global consequences, both because of the resources, uh, the shipping, uh, and, and, main, and also people will move away from the hot areas in Southern Europe and elsewhere in the world and want to live in a more civilized climate like Iceland and, <laughs> and other places, sure. <laughs> I'm very optimistic about my future. I believe that I will experience the day where Greenland is being declared independent. Because I would like to be standing with other Greenlanders one day where we are raising our flag, we're singing our national song and there's an ongoing world news saying the Greenland is independent. I'd like to experience the day. I can't imagine of a day greater, bigger than that. And I believe also Greenland being a fantastic and unique country that is still unexplored and unseen by many countries. They should discover us. Come and discover us. Gróðubreyting Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.